Hello there, friends in Christ. Welcome to the Word of Grace and to another study of a word key which unlocks the Scripture. Regeneration is our subject today. It is that sovereign act of God whereby He imparts His life to a dead human spirit. In contrast to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, whereby the believer is placed in Christ, regeneration is the work of the Holy Spirit placing Christ in the believer. Now, these two wondrous works of God take place simultaneously. It may be said with absolute assurance that every born-again believer is baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ Jesus, and everyone so identified with the one who is himself life eternal is also regenerated. They cannot be separated. Regeneration as a term actually means regenesis or rebeginning. Now this is a very apt term, for it speaks of that creative act on the part of God whereby he enables persons of his choosing to begin again where Adam was before he sinned the sin unto death. It is an act of resurrection whereby one who is dead in trespasses and sins is brought from death to life by the power of God. Regeneration is an act of restoration through redemptive renewal, whereby those who are dead in spirit and who are in fellowship with Satan are made alive in spirit and restored to fellowship with God. Commonly referred to as the new birth or being born again, regeneration is the result of a paternal act on the part of God, whereby persons who are not his sons by nature are made to be partakers of the divine nature by means of a spiritual birth from above. Now the Old Testament prophets depict regeneration as the work of Jehovah as he softens the hearts of his chosen people. Various terms are used for this, such as circumcision of the heart or writing his law in their hearts, to the end that their attitudes are changed from rebellion to obedience. Now these ideas all relate to a birth of the nation of Israel or of its rebirth. These Old Testament birth and rebirth ideas are used in several different ways. They are used of the birth of Jerusalem, Israel, in Ezekiel, of Israel being restored after the exile, of the resurrection of the nation from among the dead. In other words, there is generation and regeneration, creation and recreation, death and resurrection implied or expressed in the act of Jehovah, whereby he brings renewal, regenesis, or rebeginning. Now, we shall not be at all surprised then to discover that in the New Testament we find use of metaphors of birth, resurrection, restoration, and creation to speak of the mysterious work of the Holy Spirit in regenerating sons of Adam that they might be called sons of God. Now, perhaps the best place to begin the study of the subject is to see the absolute need that fallen man has for regeneration. As the Apostle Paul so graphically puts it in his epistle to the church at Ephesus, man by nature is dead in trespasses and sins. He is under the control of Satan, the prince of the power of the air. Not only did death pass upon Adam when he sinned, so that his human spirit died, but it was passed on to his posterity, so that all sin and continue in Adam's state of spiritual death. Hence the phrase, in Adam all die. Before Adam sinned, he was a living being. He had a living body, for he was a living soul motivated by a living spirit, which reflected the likeness of the God of the living. Precisely as the Creator had warned him, when Adam disobeyed and partook of the forbidden fruit, he died. He did not die physically, he died spiritually. Man is a spirit being, designed by the Creator to dwell in a body as a living soul, 
When Adam sinned, his human spirit died, his body were corrupted by the indwelling spirit of death. Adam thereby mirrored the likeness of Satan, the god of the dead, from that point on. He could no longer have fellowship with God, for Jehovah is the god of the living, not the god of the dead. Satan is the god of the dead. And from that time on, the sons of Adam were born with the likeness of Adam. And the likeness of Adam is that of the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. If a man is to bear the likeness of God and to know fellowship with his Creator and delight in true worship, he must be regenerated. It is imperative that a man have a regenesis, a new birth, or new beginning, if he is to be capable of worshiping and serving the true God. The unregenerate or reprobate are wholly incapable of worship and service before the Creator for the simple reason that the dead do not serve the living. As the sons of Satan, the unregenerate can only do their works of human good and human bad as unto the devil. But they cannot do so much as one single good work for the Creator. The need of mankind is regeneration. Now, the term regeneration appears only twice in the authorized or King James Version of the Bible as far as the English is concerned. At each appearance, it renders the Greek word polygenesia, a compound of palin, again, and genesia, or genesia, from which we derive the word genesis, meaning beginning. In the first instance, it denotes the eschatological restoration of all things, and in the second passage, uh, Pauline Genesia is used of renewing the individual. Now, in the passage in Matthew, the disciples are told by our Lord that in the regeneration, when he will be seated on his throne, they also will be seated on twelve thrones. In the passage in Titus, the second reference, Paul uses Pauline Genesia with reference to the work of the Holy Spirit as he simultaneously places the believer in Christ and Christ in the believer. He assures Titus that salvation has absolutely nothing to do with any righteous works on our part, but that we are saved by the mercy of God toward us, by the washing of regeneration, by the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Now, the term washing, by the way, relates to the baptisms by effusion under the Mosaic law which served as types of the cleansing and renewing to be accomplished by the Holy Spirit in his baptism in believers. Therefore, the believer is renewed or given a new beginning by means of baptismal regeneration. Now listen carefully. This baptismal regeneration of which the Bible speaks is not by water, which is simply a picture of the reality being discussed by Paul. Water has absolutely no power whatsoever to save, to renew, or to regenerate, regardless of the mode. Now, by far the most important passage dealing with the doctrine of regeneration is to be found in the third chapter of the Gospel according to John, uh, one of the most wonderful and exciting of all passages in the Bible. The Greek word used in that passage is not Genesia, but anothen, for the emphasis is upon the birth which comes by means of the Spirit of God. The word anothen is derived from ano, an adverb of place, which literally means above and upward. Ano is the autonym, or the antonym, we should say, of the Greek term kata, which means downward or a movement to a realm below. They're in marked contrast. Now, the word uh, anothen is used 13 times in the New Testament. It has a variety of English words, which were chosen by the translators of the King James Version to render it. It's translated from the beginning once. Anothen is translated from the very first once. It is rendered again three times and top, T-O-P, 
three times. In the remaining five passages, it is consistently translated from above, which is the primary meaning. Now, it's quite clear. As we examine the passages where Anothan is translated from above, that God himself is the source implied in each case. James tells us, for example, that every perfect gift is from above. That's our word, anothen. And he goes ahead to explain that the source of this perfect gift is the Father of lights. Then by way of contrast, he declares that carnal wisdom is not from above, but that it proceeds from demons, as it is found in Scripture, of the divine Sophia. Now, true wisdom is the fruit of divine illumination, the Holy Spirit's ministry to believers. Therefore, it comes down from God, who gives wisdom to all believers in proportion to their acceptance and acting upon his word. Now, whenever John uses anothen, it is, with one exception, to be rendered as from above, that's its meaning, in the sense of from God or from heaven. In the passage where he quotes the baptizer's remarks about Jesus, the heavenly bridegroom, John says, he, that is speaking of Jesus, he that cometh from above is above all, which is an open declaration that the one from above is none other than the Son of God, that Jesus is God who has, in his grace, been willing to come down among men. Later, at the time of his trial, the dear Son of God refers to his Father in heaven when he says to Pilate, Thou couldst have no power against me, except it were given thee from above. So here on the lips of Jesus, the words anothen, rendered from above, obviously refer to the Father in heaven. Now, in order to interpret properly the great passage on the new birth in the third chapter of John's Gospel, we must first decide whether the dear Savior is talking to Nicodemus about birth in the physical realm or a birth in the spiritual realm. Now, we say, oh, we're sure we know. Let's be sure by looking at the passage. Of course, this is not at all hard to do, because even the most cursory reading of the text makes it evident that our Lord is insisting upon the birth which must be from God the Father by means of the Spirit of God if one is to be a true child of the Most High. But we must examine carefully to prove this. The second thing we discover about this amazing third chapter in its opening verses where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus is that there are certain key words upon which the entire passage pivots its thought. Now the analysis of this is a bit more difficult until we observe that there are three key words, each of which has a double meaning. One meaning of this either or any one of these three words one meaning will relate to the realm of the physical. The other meaning will relate to the realm of the spiritual. Then finally, we must test each of these key pivotal words to see if it produces the same answer as the context about the word pivots upon it. Now, if there is absolute agreement in the answers produced by the three key words in the conversation between our Lord and Nicodemus, we can be assured that we're on the right track, just as long as those answers agree with all else revealed in Holy Writ concerning the Bible doctrine of regeneration. Now, without involving ourselves in a commentary upon the passage as a whole, which we do not have time for, let us examine the key statements which actually deal with regeneration or what we call the new birth or being born again. When the ruler of the Jews introduces himself with remarks which recognize that Jesus must surely be a teacher come from God because of the signs that he has been performing, sometimes called miracles, our Lord replies very bluntly, Nicodemus, 
Except a man be born again, he cannot even see the kingdom of God. Now here the words, or the word again, translates our Greek term for regeneration, anothen, or anothen, and it's obvious from the overall context of the passage that Jesus is not talking about some miraculous act whereby a man gets back into his mother's womb as a fetus and starts physical life all over again. The translation of anothen as again expresses one possible translation of the word relative to birth and thereby reflects what is in the mind of Nicodemus in the following passage. Now the other possibility for translating anothen is from above as we have seen. In the King James, it is translated again. It can also be translated from above. So we ask ourselves, does Jesus refer to a new beginning or regeneration of the physical being? Is he talking about this happening again? Or does he speak here of the necessity of being born from above, of the Father, even of the Spirit of God? Is it a physical birth? as is implied by the question of the ruler of the Jews? Or is it a spiritual birth of the heavenly Father of our Lord? Now, you must realize that whatever answer you give to this question concerning the meaning of the first key pivotal word, anothen, must match the answers to the questions concerning the second and third key pivotal words, or your first answer is wrong. Now, let's see how it works. Our gracious Savior does not really answer the crude question of Nicodemus, which may well have been given by the ruler of the Jews to lead the master on, so to speak, so that he would make a more detailed comment on the matter. But prefacing his word of explanation with his attention-arresting formula, verily, verily, from the Latin veritas, veritas, which is simply from the Greek and Hebrew, amen, amen, which means in English, truly, truly. Whenever Jesus says those words, truly, truly, or amen, amen, or verily, verily, he wants your attention. So let's listen to what the dear Son of God says. Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, this is a verse that has been taken out of context on a pretext so often. In this second statement, the key pivotal word is the Greek word kai, translated and in the King James Version of the verse just quoted. Now, kai has two meanings. Kai not only means and, but it may also carry the idea of, in other words, or that is to say. Now, this second way of translating kai is based upon a rule in Greek syntax which is connected with the presence and absence of the definite article and is called Granville Sharp's Rule. Without detailing the rule, we might sum it up by saying that when applied to the passage at hand, it simply declares that the noun following kai, or and, has reference to the noun preceding the copulative, and it gives a further description of the first noun. To put it to the verse, Sharp's rule would say here that the words of the Spirit describe more fully what Jesus meant when he says, before the and, water. In other words, the dear Lord is gently directing Nicodemus's mind from contemplating the realm of physical birth, which might deal with a bag of waters and so on, to that of spiritual birth. He first uses a Semitic symbol for the Holy Spirit, water. He follows it with the copulative kai, the and. Then he makes it clear that water is used symbolically by the words of the Spirit. The grammatical construction of this second statement of Jesus to the Pharisee who came to him by night, for John has a delightful way of subtly saying that Nicodemus was in the dark spiritually, has absolutely nothing at all to do with a bag of waters involved in physical birth. The Greek grammar, with its typical clarity, is stating that our Lord was actually saying this, except a man be born of water, that's the symbol, that is to say, born of the Spirit, he cannot enter 
the kingdom of God. We might also comment, neither is our blessed master talking about the waters of baptism so often forced upon the verse by well-meaning persons who feel obligated to preach denominational viewpoint rather than sound grammatical exegesis and exposition of the verse. Now, since the first two key pivotal words, anothen and kai, agree that the proper interpretation of the words of our Lord to Nicodemus is the man cannot see the kingdom of God, that is, he cannot perceive spiritual matters unless he is born from above, and that a man cannot enter the kingdom of God, that is, he cannot participate as a subject of the king in the realm of the spirit without being born of the spirit, let us now examine the third key pivotal word, which is pneuma. Now, seeking to orient the thinking of Nicodemus to his sphere of thought, our Lord stresses the fact that there are two kinds of birth, that which is born of the flesh, that which is born of the Holy Spirit. Being born of the flesh, of a Jewish mother and father, will never get Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews, into the kingdom. It's just not in the bloodline. It is not something a man can accomplish by his own will. It is not something that a man can get done for him by another man, by either sprinkling him or pouring him or putting him under the water. It must be a work that God alone can bring to pass. So repeating the first phrase to let Nicodemus and you and me know that he's still on the original subject, he says you must be born anothen or from above to show the puzzled Pharisee that he's still talking about the same matter. And then Jesus concludes, The wind, Numa, blows where it wills, and thou hearest the sound of it, but canst not tell from where it comes or where it goes. And so is every one who is born of the Spirit, that is, Numa. This statement, uh, the second word and last word, as we noted, is pneuma, from which we get pneumonia and pneumatic. Needless to say, when your lungs or tires are out of wind, the spirit is gone with the wind, <laughs> and both are as good as dead. Now, wind, of course, is another Semitic symbol for the Holy Spirit. Physical man cannot live without water and air. The spiritual man is dead without the Holy Spirit. We do not dictate the movement of the wind, neither do we dictate upon whom the Spirit of God will come to regenerate a dead human spirit so that he will receive spiritual truth, enter into the kingdom of the living spirits who serve the God of the living. Yet, glorious truth, those who are born of the Spirit hear the sound of the voice of God in their spirits once he has regenerated them from among the dead by the seed of his word. Now, of course, it must be remembered that whosoever is born of God doeth righteousness. In order to understand the words of John in his first epistle, we must take care to differentiate, as he does, between what is born of God, the regenerated spirit of the believer, and those who are not regenerated by him. Oh, my dear friends, as Wesley used to say again and again to people when they would say, why do you say you must be born again? He would answer, because, friend, you must be born from above. God bless you as you call upon the name of Jesus, who is mighty to save.